Welcome to Love Never Fails Television Broadcast, an outreach ministry of the Agape Family Worship Center located at 50 Fairbanks Road, Georgetown, Connecticut, Maine. We pray that the Lord will be exalted in your lives today. And as Psalms 92 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph at the work of your hands. Lord, we thank you for your holy word, and we just ask, Father, that as we turn towards your word this morning, that you would speak through us, Lord, that you would just have your way in our lives. And we thank you and we glorify you for that this morning. But Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, as we look at this message this morning, Father God, that hope would resound in our hearts and in our lives. And that you would just speak through me this morning into the lives of your people, oh God. I pray that our lives would be affected and changed by the power of your holy word. And we thank you and we praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be ending the series that we've been doing over the last five weeks uh, today. And we've been doing a series called Thy Kingdom Come, where we've been talking about the kingdom of God. And... We're going to end it today with the kingdom of hope. And this is a message of hope. I think that as I, as, I, as I stop to think about what I wanted to say to you this morning, what would be an appropriate way to end this series and, and what I felt God was saying to us, I said, uh, what would be a good way to end this? And I really, it just really struck me. Why not a message of hope? Because we all need hope in our lives. Hope is, is something that, that, that without it in our lives, really, it be, our lives changes quite a bit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But we've been talking over the last few weeks about the kingdom of God. And we started where we were talking about the kingdom of God coming, where we talked about the prayer that Jesus prayed, the famous Lord's Prayer, where he says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Now we moved on to talk about the fact that the kingdom of God was unshakable, that, that we have security in God in the fact that the kingdom cannot be moved, it cannot be shaken, it cannot be destroyed. While earthly kingdoms can, the kingdom of God cannot be. Then we talked about how the kingdom affects my life. And then last week we talked about the king of the kingdom and how important the king of the kingdom is, as a matter of fact, I've had quite a few of you come to me and say to me, you know, this whole series was, was, was nice, but, but it wasn't really until last week when you, you did that message about the king of the kingdom that it kind of just brought it all together for me. And I was blessed by that because that was what I was hoping would happen. What it, it wouldn't just be one message after another, but that it would sort of round it all off for you and bring it all together. But I thought, how can we end this? on a good note. And I thought, hope. Hope is, is an excellent way to end this. And so we're talking about a kingdom of hope. So what does Easter remind us of? What hope does Easter remind us of? And the hope that Easter reminds us of is the hope that God has been trying to give us for many years from the beginning, from creation. One thing God did was God gave us hope in the beginning, and throughout the years, it has lasted. And if we look at our Bibles, we can see throughout the Bible God's message of hope to his people. God has never left us. He's never abandoned us. He's, he's never not given us away. He's never not provided for us. He's, he's never just left us on our own to suffer, wallow in our grief, to, to just die on our own. He has always, always been there. And that message of hope is what we're talking about this morning. You know, as, as I started to really think about it, I was like, you know, where in the Bible can I go and look to find scriptures of hope? And then it kind of hit me. Well, the whole Bible is a message of hope. It's the message of hope that God gave to us from, from the beginning God showed us. From, from Genesis 1, it was clear that when God is our refuge and he is our strength and he is our source, then we have hope. And so this morning as we talk about that, we also want to look at, because it's Easter Sunday, one of the greatest messages of hope that we've ever been given, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that hope 
applies to our lives. And so today, we celebrate hope. So what is hope? Well, the dictionary will define hope as a person or thing in which our expectations are centered. For example, before Emily and I got married, I was hopeful that Emily would fall for me. As a matter of fact, uh, I was saying, we were talking earlier this week, and, and we, it's been eight months since we've been married, and I said to her, I said, geez, that's all? So I feel like I've been married to you forever? But we, we put hope in a person, in a thing. You know, when, we, when we're making a deal, when we're talking to someone about doing something, we hope. Like when we're building a friendship, for instance, we hope that, that by creating a relationship with this person and myself, that it's going to be a good relationship. And so hope requires an element of trust. We put our expectations in someone or something. Like, for instance, your car. When you get in your car, you hope your car is going to work. You have a certain expectation of it. But then it also means to look forward with desire and reasonable confidence. And this is very important because what it's talking about is that we look to the future. We're looking ahead in hope. We're looking ahead with a confidence, with, with a desire to see something happen. And so I want to bring the last definition that the dictionary gives for us. And it's just very simple. It says to believe, to desire, and to trust. These are very important definitions that we have here because I believe in, in, in order for us to fully understand the message this morning, we have to understand what hope is. But Rabbi Zacharias gives a definition for hope, and here's what he says. He says, hope is the indispensable element that makes the present so important. Significantly, the absence of future hope has an amazing capacity to reach into the present and eat away at the structure of life as termites would, a giant foundation. Here's what Ravi Zacharias is saying. He's saying that without hope, the human life, the structure of human life falls to pieces. I don't know if you know very much about termites, but termites eat whatever they can get a hold of. Anything that, that is possible for them to eat, they're going to eat. And what they do is, is they destroy whatever they're in. So, so for instance, if you have termites in your cabinets, guess what's happening to your cabinets? They're being eaten. They're being destroyed. And guess what? It's going to cost you lots of money to fix. And here's what Ravi Zacharias is saying. He's saying that, that without hope, our lives are like termites. Like we're like the cabinet, and termites are just eating through our lives. They're eating at the structure of our lives, and we fall apart. We fall to pieces. And so it's important that we remember that God has given us, given us a living hope. And that life, the structure of our lives, can be firm, it can be secure. We have a foundation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hope is at the very foundation of our lives, and, and without it, we are destroyed. But thank God that He sent His Son to be my hope to be your hope, so that we could have a hope, not in just this life, but in the life to come. In 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, because Jesus is alive today, we have hope. Do you know you have hope this morning? Let me see, Hannah, if you know you have hope this morning. You have hope this morning. You know, sometimes, even though we have hope, it doesn't always feel like we have hope. It's not always easy to hope. It's not always easy to believe in hope. It's not an easy thing, especially when you are going through something difficult in your own life. When you're facing difficult circumstances, it is definitely not an easy thing. But you know, as I, as I tell people all the time, people sometimes approach me and, and, and they, they're feeling exactly that, hopeless. And they'll say to me, well, you know, where was God in all of this? 
What is God doing? Where, where is he in the midst of it? And, and we, always ex- or we always assume that when God comes, that God is going to blow the doors open and announce, I am here, when he doesn't always do that. Sometimes God just comes in that quiet, that still, that, that small voice. And Peter is saying here, listen, we have a hope, but we don't just have any kind of hope. We're not hoping in somebody who's dead. He says we have a living hope, meaning that Jesus, who is our hope, he is still alive and he lives forevermore. Dr. Emil Brunner says this. He says, what oxygen is for the lungs, such is hope for the meaning of human life. Take oxygen away and death occurs through suffocation. Take hope away, and humanity is constricted through lack of breath, despair, and hopelessness sets in. We all have to breathe. We all need oxygen. You ever thought of hope being like oxygen? Like, it's so important to our lives that we as human beings cannot live without it. You know, without oxygen in this room, all of us would begin to suffocate and die. We all have to breathe. We all need that oxygen flowing through our body, flowing in our blood in order for us to live. And without the hope that is Jesus Christ, guess what? We're slowly dying. You see, the hope that Jesus came to bring us was a hope that was, was different than, than, than anything that anyone had ever seen before. Jesus came to bring us a hope that was so different that, that even his own people had a hard time recognizing the hope that he came to bring. And so what hope was that? What hope did Jesus die and rise again to give us? Well, first of all, well, I'm going to give you a few things here. I'm going to give you five things here. And the first one that I want to give you is the hope of life. The hope of life. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What's he saying there? Jesus is saying that I am the source of life. I am the well of life. I am the pool of life. It is me that you come to in order to receive Life. And so one of the things that Jesus died, but not just died, rose again to give us is a life or the hope of life. In John 10.10 10, it says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, one of the things that is, is so interesting is, is how, you know, everybody seems to be on this health and fitness crave. Like Everybody. You know, you, you walk down the street, you look on your Facebook, you look on the news, you listen to the radio. I mean, you're constantly hearing everything is, is, is oh, eat, eat better, work better, work out better, do this, do that, do the next thing. And everybody's just, you know, taking pictures of themselves in the gym. I, I've never seen so many pictures of vegetables in my life. I don't know why people care so much. And I'll go on my Facebook and I look at, and I'm like, where's the meat? It's all green. I don't like all green. Green is good in some cases, but I like a little bit of color that's different. See, I'm doing better with my vegetables. I keep telling people, I said, my wife has accomplished the impossible. I actually ask about vegetables now. What vegetables are we having, honey? Uh, See what marriage does to you? (laughs) It's good. It's good. I'm just... uh, but everybody's on this health craze, you know, wanting to eat healthier, wanting to, to look healthier, wanting to live healthier. And, you know, as I, as I just thought about it, I was like, you know, we, we, we have this hope of life, of wanting to make life better. And so what do we do? Well, we say, okay, well, you know, maybe I don't like vegetables, but I need to suck it up and eat some more vegetables because they're, they're good for me. I don't like, you know, going for a walk or running or, or you know, anything like that, but, but I need to because it's, it's good for me. And we have this hope of increasing the quality of the life that we have. And Jesus has very plainly said to us, listen, I can increase the quality of the life that you have. 
You notice Jesus didn't say, I, I came to give you some life. No, he says, I have come that you may have life. I want to give you life. I want to give you more than what you have. I want to give you life. But he says, I don't want to just give you life. I want to make it more abundant. He says, so I'm going to give you something good, but I'm going to take what I've already given you that is good, and I'm going to make it greater. I'm going to make it better. And so Jesus hasn't just given us the hope of life, but he's given us the hope of great life, of abundant life, of abundant living. You see, a lot of people think that Jesus just comes and wants to impose a bunch of rules on us and regulations on us and laws on us. And then we, we go, well, why would I ever want to be a Christian? All the, all the Bible does is tell us what I can't do. I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the next thing. And as a matter of fact, as, as the church, and I admit as preachers, we are very good at telling you what you can't do. But we never tell you what you can do. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why we have not seen, uh, uh, in Christianity as a whole, more people living for God on fire for God because we're doing a good job at telling people what they can't do. But guess what? When you tell people what they can't do, guess what? That makes them want to do it all the more. But when we tell people about what they can do, about how they can live, you see, I believe Jesus is more concerned about how we live versus what we don't do. He wants to give us that life, that abundant life, and Jesus wants us to live so badly. What did he do? He died so that we could live. He died that we wouldn't just have life but have abundant life. That's how bad he wants us to live. You know, God is very practical. God is very practical. You know, as I, I see Sister Janet here, and I sometimes listen to Sister Janet just talk about the things that God has revealed to her, and they're, they're just so practical. I just, I think back on some of the, you know, you would be surprised at some of the weirdest ways God gives me messages, like cleaning dishes, sweeping the floor, doing the laundry. I mean, God will just speak to me when I'm doing stuff, and he speaks to me through the very thing that I'm doing, driving. These are all very simple, practical things that we do every day of our lives, and yet God speaks to me through them, and he doesn't just speak to me and say, oh, yeah, you know, you're driving. No, no, he speaks life into me as I do these things. Jesus died so that we could live abundantly, so that, that we would have the hope of abundant life. But, but the second thing is that Jesus died and rose again that we could have hope in death. And usually when we, we got, start talking about this, when people start to cringe. Because then we start thinking about dying. But bear with me for a moment. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, it, here's what it says. It says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in all Adam die, I mean, in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. And it's talking about the fact that Jesus died, but he's also talking about the fact that in Jesus, we have a hope that goes beyond this life. The hope of Jesus be, extends beyond this life into the next life. The hope of Jesus extends from this earth on to eternity. But I want to show you something interesting here. One thing I've, I've really noticed more and more and more is that most people or most Christians tend to either have a, a large focus on the hope that we have in this life or the hope that we have in death. Most people never take the two and combine them together. Most people are either living to die or don't want to die at all. And it's interesting that the responses that you get from people when, when you're talking to them and, and their focus is different. Because when you talk to somebody who, who is constantly thinking about the hope that they have in death, they sound like they're suicidal and like they're just, they don't care, just take me and I'm gone. Like, who, who cares? And you talk to them and it's sometimes it's kind of scary, maybe even frustrating to talk to them because they sound kind of morbid. They just sound like they're just, just take me, Lord, I'm ready to go. But then you talk to people that, that have just this focus on the hope that we have in this life. And then, you know, anytime anything bad happens, it's just, well, well, why would God let this happen to me? You know, didn't God say he would give me the desires of my heart that if I asked that he would give? And, and, and we have this focus on, on what God is going to do in this life. 
and never the fact that God has given us a promise for both this life and the next. You see, God's focus was never the hope that we had in this life or the hope that we had in death. His focus was my next point, and I'm not going to go there yet. But you know, because we usually have a certain focus, or a half focus is what I like to call it, because we're not focusing on the big picture, we're focusing on half the picture, we're, we're focusing on what Jesus can give us in this life, or, or, or what Jesus can give us in death, we only see half the picture. And it creates an issue in us. And so, let me bring the next point then. The hope that Jesus died to give us and rose to give us wasn't just one in death and wasn't just one in life, but was one in eternity, which is the third point. We have hope in eternity. In Titus 1-2 it says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. You see, the focus of our lives is not whether we have hope in life or hope in death. Jesus died to give us hope in life. He rose to give us hope in death. But this, the, that's not the whole picture. That's just a part of the picture. You see, the whole picture is that we would have hope in eternity. Now, we tend to think of eternity as, well, when Jesus comes back and, you know, we go to heaven and all that good stuff. That's not eternity. We are living in eternity now. Eternity has no beginning and has no end because God is the measure of time. He says he has no beginning and no end. Guess what? Eternity is for all time. And so when we talk about that we have a hope in eternity, here's what we're saying is that no matter what time it is, God has given us a hope. Whether it's in life, whether it's in death, it doesn't matter. We have a hope for all time because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we have that hope that is eternal. That hope that extends from this life and onward. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm, I'm working on a message talking about eternity, but, but here's the thing that, that we often don't think about, is that we all are going to live forever. We're all going to live forever. We're, when, when we die and we leave this body, we're going to leave this body, and yes, this body will die, but we're going to live forever in our spirit after this. But not all of us are going to live forever in our spirit in heaven. Not all of us are going to live forever with God in eternity. Some of us aren't going to go to heaven. Some of us are going to go to heaven. Some of us aren't. The point that I'm making here today is this, is that the choice of where we go in eternity is ours. The choice of where we spend our eternity, the choice of where we go to live forever is ours, not God's. He left the choice with us. And the choice is whether we choose him or not, whether we choose the abundant life that Jesus died and rose to give us or not. And so Jesus gave us a hope. You know, you can give somebody hope and they not take it. We can choose despair over hope, but that is our choice. You know, as I, I just think back on, on, on you know, at, at various points in my life where people have tried to help me where maybe I, I had nowhere else to turn, no one to go to, and somebody came through on my behalf and said, let me help you. Now I have the choice of saying to them, well, no, no, that's okay, I don't want your help, I don't need your help, or I can say, okay, well, I'll let you help me. I will let you be my hope in this situation. You see, that's what Jesus did. Jesus died, he rose again, and then he says, let me be your hope. Let me be the hope that you have for eternity, the hope that you have of a better life. You see, God's focus isn't this world. God's focus isn't death. God's focus is eternity. He looks at the big picture, and we have to learn to look at the big picture. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we among all men are the most pitiable. Here's what Paul is saying. Is that if God, if Jesus Christ died only so that we could have a hope in this life, in, in, in what we can see now, this earth, this world. 
If this is all the hope that we have, then guess what? We should be the most pitied on all the earth. But he's saying God didn't just die. He didn't just rise again. He didn't just become a man for the purpose that we could have a hope in this world. He did what he did so that we could have a hope for all eternity. And that's the important thing. So let's look at the big picture, not focus on just part of it. Well, then we have another hope, and, and, and this is one that I particularly love. The hope of peace and joy. In Romans 15, 13, it says, Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, God, I, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. God, God's desire is for us to be successful. Now, we can have a different measure of success than God does, but his desire is for us to be successful. His desire is for us to live abundantly. His desire is that we would have life, but, but not just that we would have life, but that we would have peace and joy in life. And you see, this is one of the things that is so important or, or that I love about God is that, is that God wants what is best for us. You know, as we, as we talk about the kingdom of God and as we talk about the fact that, that the kingdom of God has hope or is, it, or is a kingdom of hope, it just reminds me so much that when Jesus came, when Jesus died, when Jesus lived, when Jesus rose again, that one of the things that Jesus always tried to do was give peace and joy to the people that he ministered to. Whether that was his disciples, whether that was the, the crowd of 5,000 people, whether that was just one woman standing at a well, it didn't matter. Jesus always intended to minister peace and joy into the lives of people. And sometimes they walked away with it and didn't even recognize what Jesus had done to their life. They just knew that they were changed because they had encountered the living God. There's one thing that, that I see more and more every day is that as people, we do not live lives of peace and we do not live lives of joy. Our lives are quite disturbed. Our lives are quite shaken. We, 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 we don't live every day with peace in our hearts. You see, having peace in your heart doesn't mean that our outside situations are okay. It means that I'm all right on the inside. Joy doesn't mean that everything on the outside is going well. It doesn't mean that, that your life is all peachy and put together so well that when people look at you, they go, oh, they never faced anything in their life. They ain't going through anything. They're having the, the greatest day of their life. They, I wish I wasn't going through what they were going through right now. You know, I remember a few years ago, somebody said to me, uh, this was just after my father passed away, and this person didn't know, and, and I said, man, you're looking so good. I don't know that i ever seen you look this good in your life. And I'm standing there thinking to myself, I just went through one of the most terrible things I could have ever gone through in my life, and you telling me this is the best you ever seen me looking? This is terrible. I was like, how did I look before? Jeez. And I remember I, 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 just, I was having a hard time wrapping my head around it. I wasn't offended by what they said. I was just puzzled out of my mind. And I'm thinking to myself, I am a wreck. My father just passed away. My family is back home. I'm back, uh, you know, however many hundred miles away from my family. And, and I am a wreck right now. And I went back to my room and I was praying. I was saying, God, how could this be one of the best, some of the best ways I've ever looked at or that this person has ever seen me look? And God said to me, it's because in you there's peace and joy. And the Lord reminded me of the scripture here. You see, my outside situations, the things that I was facing in life may not have been all Humpty Dumpty. It may not have been all good and, and placed together. I felt like Humpty Dumpty that had fallen off the wall. I felt cracked. I felt broken. I felt like nobody could piece me back together again except God. But then God reminded me that in me that there was a hope of peace and joy. That in me that there was something that was greater than even the circumstances that I faced. That was even greater than the pain that I was feeling in my heart. That there was a living hope within me. And that living hope was Jesus. 
and that in him I had hope. In him I had peace. In him I had joy. In him I had life. And I didn't need to worry. Because he was who he said he would be. He says he would provide all of our needs. That's why they call him Jehovah Jireh. And that's exactly what he does. He provides what we need, and we need to have a life that is filled with peace and joy once more. But some of us don't have that life that is filled with peace and joy anymore. You see, God wants to give you peace. He wants to give you joy. Not that your circumstances would be better, but that you would be better. You see, God works through us in our circumstances. He gives us hope, and our hope is in him. Our hope in him then pours out over everything that we face, everything that we go through. And that brings me to my last point. He gives us the hope of the future. He gives us the hope for tomorrow. Jeremiah 29 and 11 is one of those scriptures where, where God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, many of us, I, I doubt there's anybody here who's going to go to bed tonight and think, yeah, I guess what, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow morning, so there's no hope for tomorrow. doubt anybody here is going to do that, or if there is, there are very many people in this room. I'm pretty sure most of us are going to lay in bed tonight, either turn on the TV or spend some time praying or something like that, fall asleep and expect to wake up tomorrow morning. Most of us have hope and don't even realize we have hope. Most of us believe, most of us expect, most of us uh, just, just are waiting for these things to happen, but, but don't really realize that we have it. You know, it's interesting that God says to his people here in Jeremiah 29 and 11, and I know the plans, the thoughts that I have for you, plans to prosper you. Plans of peace, plans of, uh, not of evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. You know, the whole reason why Jesus came was that so we had a future. The whole reason why Jesus became our hope was so that we could have a future. He wanted to be our living hope. He is our living hope. But in being our hope, he's provided a future for us. He's provided something for us that is so mind-blowing that we even have a hard time believing it. You know, God says this here in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you and on and so forth. He give you a future to give you a hope. But you know what's interesting? That just a few verses down, they go into slavery. Babylon comes and destroys them and, and takes them away. And yet, just a few verses before they were destroyed and taken away, God says, I know what I have in store for you. And he says, I know that there is a future in store for you, that I have a plan, I have a purpose for you, my people. You know, sometimes that's exactly what it's like for us. Is that those situations that we're facing on the outside make it look like tomorrow there is no hope. But God is telling us, listen, I know what I have for you. I know the plans that I have stored up for you. I know the peace, the joy, the life that I have for you. And what I want for you to do is to trust me. Trust me. The situation you may be facing now may not be easy. But God is preparing for you a future. He's pre no, as a matter of fact, God isn't preparing the future for you. God is preparing you for the future. He is preparing you for the things that he has for you. As a matter of fact, that's why Israel went into to, to, to bondage and slavery and all kinds of things so many times. It was because God was preparing them. They wouldn't let themselves be prepared. They wouldn't prepare themselves. So God had to do it for them. Somebody said to me they wandered around the desert for 40 years. God couldn't have been leading them. They must have been lost. They weren't lost. God was directing their every path. He was directing where they were going because he was preparing them for what he had prepared for them. It brings me to John 14, 3, which said, where Jesus says, he says, 
I go to prepare a place for you. You see, God doesn't just carry us to the future. He goes ahead of us to our future and prepares our future for us. And then he comes back and then he says, let me prepare you for what I have for you up ahead now. And you see, we, we, we do not understand the concept because when we begin to face things, we begin to go, oh, God has abandoned me. Where are you, Lord? What happened? Why, Jesus? And we start to cry and we, we begin to weep and we begin to go, God, where are you? You're not here. You're not listening. You're not answering my prayers. What's happening, God? And God is saying, I'm preparing you. He says, I have made a place for you. I have prepared it for you. We just got to get there now. And sometimes we make the road a little bit more difficult than we need to. You know, I'll say this. It's interesting to watch how many times God had something for Israel. And right when they were about to get it, they did something stupid and messed it up. Like, for instance, when they came out of Egypt and they were going in to the land of Canaan, and God told them to go. And they didn't want to listen to God. God had prepared the future for them. He had prepared something for them. But when they got to the point where God says, all right, now seize the future that I have prepared for you, they were afraid and they said, no, no, that's okay. And then God says, all right, well, guess what? None of you that are alive today are, are going to enter the land because you have not trusted in me. You, have not, you, you, you are not prepared for what I prepared for you. And then they go, no, 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 God, I'm sorry. All right, God, I'll do it now. I'll do it now. And then they run in and they go to try and fight the natives in the land. And what happens? They get destroyed because God did not go with them. You know, we're, we're like that many times. God has prepared something for us. He's giving us the hope for tomorrow, but we fail to receive it. We fail to take hold of it. We take to seize what God is giving to us. So if in the kingdom of God we've been provided this hope, then what do we do now? Well, we put it to use. We put the hope that has been given to us to use. You know, as I thought about this, I, I thought, what, what would be an easy way to explain this? One of the easiest ways to explain this is money. We have money. What do we have money for? Well, to spend it. You know, we can save. And that's great that we save. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't save. But what good is money if it just sits in the bank and you never spend it? You know, if I took a million dollars, ten dollars, a thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, doesn't matter how much it is. If I take it and I stick it in the bank and I never use it, I never touch it. Does it really matter how much money I have? No. I could, I could steal all the money in the world and put it in my bank account. And if I never use it, what good would it have been to me? None. It's just sitting there. And the bank don't give you very much interest anyway. So that's useless too. You know, many of us are like that. God has put so much into us. He's put so much hope, so much life, so, so much into us. He's poured into us so much, and, and, and we're just sitting on it, doing nothing with it. You know, God wants to do something with us as his people. God wants to, to change our lives, change our perspective from a perspective of destitution to a perspective of hope. From a perspective of destruction to a perspective of life. You know, one of the things that I... I, I really, that God has really been speaking to me about so much. He's, is, is God saying, if I pour into you, what, do I, what am I pouring into you for? Because I was praying for the church, I was praying for the ministry, I was praying for God to use me. Wherever he puts me, whatever I'm doing, I said, God, I want you to pour into me. I want you to, to use me. Fill me up, Lord. That was my cry. 
Fill me up, fill me up, fill me up. And, and, I'm, and this is my cry to God. And, and God asked me one day, he says, what am I filling you for? And I went, um, whatever you want to do with me. And it really struck me in that moment. We ask God for a lot of things that we have no idea what we're asking him for. We ask God for, we ask God to do something, but we have no idea why we're asking God to do it. It's become commonplace that we say, well, God, fill me. God, use me. And what God is saying is, for what purpose? And God didn't even answer the question. God just left me there thinking, why am I pouring into you? Why am I pouring into your life? And eventually I came to the conclusion for me to pour out what you've poured into me. For me to put to use what you're, you've given me. It doesn't matter whether it's in here, where, whether it's somewhere out there. It doesn't matter where it is. You pour into me, God, and I'm going to pour out. And that's what he does. You know, God gave us the hope of salvation. He gave us the hope of life in Jesus Christ. But he didn't just give it to us for us to hold on to it. He gave it to us for us to share it with others. God rarely ever, or I can't even, even think of a, a, an instance where God has ever done this, to be honest. At least not off the top of my head. Where God pours into our life for our purpose or, or for our good and our good alone. God pours into our life, but he pours into our life that we might affect other people. So when he gives us hope, he gives us hope that we might bring someone else hope. When he gives us joy, he gives us joy that we might bring someone else joy. He gives us peace so that we may bring someone else peace. He gives us life to give someone else life. He never pours into me for my own selfish ambition, for my own selfish reasons. He pours into me that others might be blessed through me. You know, my wife and I went fishing last night. Well, really, we went feeding the fish is what I like to call it because um, they were eating all the bait. We were there fishing and, and going, and, and all of a sudden I heard, oh, I got one. Rolling it up, rolling it up, and I'm thinking, Lord, help me out here a little bit. At least let me hook something. Even if it's just a rock, I'll say it was something big. And she catches one fish and she reels it up. And, and then after that, I'm like, I've been through two, two whole squids already and I still not caught nothing. And, you know, I was sitting down and I was just looking at the stars. And, you know, I, 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 it just started to remind me of Abraham. When God tells Abraham, look at the sky. He says, look at the stars. He says, see, see all the stars in the sky. He says, your descendants will be more numerous than even all the stars in the sky. And then it hit me when God said, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And I really thought about it for a second, and I, and I, and I said, you know, God gave Abraham a great inheritance. I mean, I was just looking at the stars in the sky, and I was like, there are, I mean, just in this one little small section of what I can see, there are so many stars. God tells him he's going to have more descendants than that. But then he continues to say, all the nations of the world will be blessed because of you. And you know something? None of us can deny that to this day. Because to this day, what God did through the line of Abraham is still happening. The nations are still being blessed. That was in the beginning of the Bible. That was in Genesis. And yet all that time has passed. The time since Jesus has come. And God is still blessing the nations through the line of Abraham. God always fulfills his hope. So how do we put this to use? Well, the first thing I want to suggest to you today is stop waiting for the kingdom to come. 
You know, we, we, we entitled this message, Thy Kingdom Come, but guess what? We got to start waiting for the kingdom to come. It's already here. It's already here. You know, I, 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 I laugh sometimes because we go, God, we're waiting on you to move. God, we just, we want you to move, Lord. And I'm thinking to myself sometimes after I finish praying, God, are we really waiting on you to move? Or are you waiting on us to move? Which one are you doing? You know, God gives us hope, but, but having said that, we have to respond to the hope that God has given to us. You see, he gives us hope, yes, but we have to respond to it. You know, God never just gives us something again for our benefit. And God doesn't just put something in your lap and go, oh, here it is. He wants us to respond. You know, I, can, I, I could sign a check right now and for a million dollars, which I don't have, so it wouldn't be any good to you, but hypothetically, if I sign a check for a million dollars right now and I, and I held it here, I said whoever gets here first can have it. We might have a war on our hands, but um, if, if you just sit in your chair, what good is that to you? You're not even going to have the hope of getting it. You could just sit in your chair and just sit there and sit there and sit there. And guess what? This big blessing is right here waiting for you. But you're just sitting there. Now what, you want me to come down there and give it to you? Why you if you really wanted that bad, why you didn't come get it? You know, we pray and we say, God, God, do this, God. Lord, I'm just waiting for you to just break through and to move. And we pray that prayer all the time. And God's saying, yeah, yeah, why don't you get up and move? I'm doing it through you. God provided us hope through Jesus. And in order for Jesus to accomplish what God wanted to, prov uh, to provide to us, Jesus had to move. He had to do what God was commanding him to do. And so he stopped waiting for the kingdom of God. He started moving with the kingdom of God. And then you know what he did? He responded to whatever God needed of him. You know, some of us are in difficult places in our lives. Some of us are praying. Some of us have been praying. Some of us are asking and seeking and looking. But how many of us are responding? How many of us are responding to God? We're in difficult places in our lives. And, and, and you know, we say, I don't, I don't know that I can do this anymore. We've been asking God to do something on our behalf, but, but we've been asking him really without feeling any hope in our lives, without even looking or any hope. We're just on that last ditch effort. We're just like, well, maybe I should. You know what the cure for depression is? Hope. You know, as I, as I thought about this, I remember David in Psalms 4 to 11 where he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? He says, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You see, hope can cure a lot of things in our lives. But hope placed in the right place. You ever believed in someone or expected someone to do something and they really only messed you up? They only made it worse for you. So why did God give us hope? Because God wants us to succeed. He wants us to succeed. You know, we, we are God's children. You know, and, and I hope there's no parents in this room that are like this, but I, don't, I can't say that I know of any parents who don't want their children to succeed. You know, I get to talk to a lot of parents sometimes, you know, sometimes after church, sometimes phone calls and so forth. And, and you know, I just, I just want the best for my child. I just want them to succeed. I just want them to be successful. I don't want them to have to grow up the way that I grew up. I, I want more. I want better for them. But without hope, we cannot accomplish 
or we cannot overcome the difficulties in our life. God gave us hope that we would be able to conquer, that we would be able to overcome. You know, through the greatest act of love that had ever been done, which was Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead. The greatest act of love. He gave us hope. Emmanuel Kant, who's a German philosopher, I'm getting ready to close that one here. He said there's three questions that every person asks. He says, what can I know? What shall I do? And for what shall I hope? You know, sometimes it's hard to believe or to, to have hope. You know, after Jesus died, his, his disciples, some of them had a hard time even believing that he had risen. Even though that there were some of his disciples that went and said, well, there's an empty tomb. Some of them had a hard time believing that Jesus was alive. But they still felt hopeless. The person they believed in, loved, gave everything to, was now dead, and so was their hope. But until on the third day, they went to visit his tomb. And when they got there, the tomb was empty. Until on the third day, they approached this tomb and realized that, that, that Jesus was not there anymore. And I'm sure one of the first things that went through their mind was, well, where is he? Who took his body? Until an angel appears to them and says, he's not dead. He's risen. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 28, 5 and 6, it says, this is the angel speaking. He says, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen just as he said. So come and see the place where he was laying. The angel said, I know you're here looking for hope, searching for hope. But do not despair because your hope has risen. He is alive and there is hope for tomorrow. What does the song say? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Why? Just because he lives. That's a song of hope. So Jesus died and rose again so that we could have hope. If we want to see the kingdom of God move in, in a way like we've never seen before, guess what? Just hope. Respond to God. And I remember somebody saying, just leap and let him catch you. He says, if you fall, don't worry. He's there to pick you up. So let's respond to the Lord this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, we just, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Father God, that, that this morning we can stand here and say that, that you have given us a hope, not just any hope, but a living hope. That because of what you did on the cross, that, that we can say here today, I have a hope not in this, just in this life, but in death. I don't just have a hope now, but I have a hope for all eternity. And no matter what I do, no matter where I am, that Jesus Christ is my hope. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can pray for the kingdom to come because it's a kingdom of hope. That we need not worry because your kingdom is unshakable and that we have security in you. And that Jesus is the living hope that we put our trust in 
that he is that king of the kingdom that we can rely on and that we praise. We thank you that he is our hope and our salvation. And as we leave here today, Lord, help us to leave here with those words in our heart, those words of life, those words of hope, the words of tomorrow, because there is a tomorrow for us as long as we trust in you. So Lord, have your way in us. Have your way in us, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Stand with me. You know you have a hope this morning? You sure? I don't know that I believe you. You got to act like you have hope if you have hope. Where's your smiles? <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm not smiling. You know, we, we have a living hope in Jesus Christ today. That's something to rejoice over. That's something to be glad about. Jesus Christ is alive and in him we have hope not for today or not just for today but hope for tomorrow and for forevermore. Thank you. And Jesus is alive today and I think that that's something to celebrate. I think that's something to rejoice over, don't you? Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching our television program and we pray that you've been blessed by today's message. I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks and I'd like to take this opportunity to pray with you today and ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, I want you to pray with me this prayer and accept him into your heart today. And you too can be a child of God. Let's pray this prayer. God, I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for all the wrong that I've done. And I ask you to come into my life today. Cleanse me and make me whole. I'm sorry, and I ask you to lead me down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. I want to be your child, and I want to do your will. Have your way in me today, Lord, and I will forevermore live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's all you had to do, folks. It's as simple as that. And so if you pray that prayer today, you're a child of God. And so I want to get you plugged into a church. Get plugged into a body, a fellowship of Christ somewhere. And get deeper into your relationship with God. Because there's no greater relationship than a relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful day with Jesus.